you join me this morning back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and um, you'll be hearing that a lot because this is a long chapter, and a chapter we don't want to um, rush through. Uh, it's a chapter that deals with the essential truth of the resurrection of the believer because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so there's a lot here for our practical Christian experience, and uh, we want to unpack it the best that we can. This morning, we'll be studying verses 12 through 19, but I want to read through verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And now Paul shows some logical consequences of that. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Another consequence. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. That's a terrible place to be. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But I can't wait till next week to get to verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The Apostle Paul was a man who believed in truth. God's truth, which is the only kind of truth. He didn't play around with it. He was not willing to stake his life on something that would prove to be a lie. There was a French mathematician, Christian philosopher by the name of Blaise Pascal, who lived in the 17th century. And he came up with what has been well known as Pascal's Wager. Pascal's wager was basically this. And when it comes to belief in the existence of God, he argued, if I believe that God exists, and in the end we find out he doesn't exist, I haven't lost anything. But if I believe that God exists, or sorry, if you don't believe that God exists and he does exist, you lose everything. On the surface, that sounds like a really good argument, but I've never found it very compelling because God does exist, and there's really no wager in it. We should not approach the Christian life as though, well, we might be wrong because we're not wrong, because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. The Apostle Paul, I think, would reject Pascal's wager because he was persuaded that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and therefore Christianity is true. And we who profess to believe in Jesus Christ, we who profess to be saved, we too need to have the same solid conviction that Jesus Christ is alive, that the resurrection is both a biblical truth and a historically verifiable truth. The resurrection is the truth on which everything else hinges. Paul's going to argue that without the resurrection, Christian ministry would be pointless. Without the resurrection, personal faith would be ineffective. Without the resurrection of Christ, God's character is called into question. Without the resurrection of Christ, Christians are still in need of salvation, and any sense of future hope is removed, and our present experience is meaningless. The resurrection matters. And Paul is going to argue the logic of the resurrection. 
And that's important because the resurrection of Christ in the past and the resurrection of believers in the future have deep practical significance for the present. Believing in Christ who was raised from the dead in the past, believing that believers will rise from the dead in the future affects how we live now. It matters. And so Paul is going to argue that actually through this whole chapter. But in this section, verses 12 to 19, he shows us very cl- clearly the logic of the resurrection. He first of all identifies a logical problem, verses 12 to 13, and then verses 14 to 19, the logical peril from that problem. So first of all, logical problem. He says in verse 12, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And that's a problem. Paul, as we saw last week, is addressing this problem in the church about denying the resurrection primarily of believers. They're not so much, they're not denying the resurrection of Christ. So they believe in that, but they have been taught by some people who do not, do not know God. At the end of the chapter, or in verse 33, he talks about those that we need to, to stay away from who have infiltrated the church who do not know God. They do not know God's power, and they've come in with an otherworldly philosophy, and they're teaching the common Greek understanding that that which is physical is bad. That which is physical is evil. And therefore, they say, they said, that if you're a Christian, that when you die, your soul is immortal, your soul will live forever, but why would your soul want to have an evil body once again? So they're denying the bodily resurrection of the believer. They have no problem believing in the immortality of the soul, but they were saying that there's no resurrection of the body. The body doesn't matter. That's a problem. Paul is going to argue because Jesus Christ rose from the dead with a what? Body. He rose with a body that is not evil, a body that was glorified, and as we'll argue in this chapter, that's the kind of body that Christians will have. The good news of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead, he rose bodily, that good news contains within it the good news that we're going to rise again as Christians. The good news is that one day, after I die, my body, when Christ returns, my body will be perfected. It will be glorified. It will no longer be short. (laughs) I met a friend of Tommy's the other day. Um, He was visiting here. He's a pilot for Delta. And uh, he said to me, he said, "Um, you're taller than I imagined. (laughs) And it felt good to talk to someone who was shorter than me. One day, you will have a glorified body, and that's good news. That gives hope for us. There are those today in Christendom who have embraced this kind of a dualism that says that the physical is bad, the spiritual is good. That's infiltrated even conservative circles where we almost treat the physical as though it doesn't matter. It does matter. And we're not going to spend eternity in disembodied bodies. Sorry, with disembodied souls. We're going to spend eternity in glorified bodies. We're not going to just be floating around. We're going to be on a glorified earth doing things that we do today. I think we'll be working for eternity, but a working of a different kind. I'm going to have to save that for next week as I start to unpack that. The reality is that if we deny what Paul is saying, if we deny the resurrection of our bodies, then there's a real sense that we're denying the resurrection of Christ's body. The two go hand in hand. 
He says, if Christ is proclaimed, if what we have heralded, that he has been raised from the dead, how can we even think that we're not going to rise from the dead? And there's a beautiful truth here, that Christ's destiny is our destiny. That because we're in Christ, what he experienced is what we'll experience. Paul unpacks that in Romans chapter 6, speaking about when Christ was crucified. If you believe in Christ, guess what? You were crucified in him. When he was raised from the dead, you were raised with him, and he's seated on the right hand of the Father. That's where we are seated. We are having, we, we are in a sense in two locations. We are in the right hand of the Father in Christ, and we are here today. And Paul says the resurrection, believing the resurrection of the body of the Christian to everlasting life, and as I will unpack in weeks ahead, everybody is going to be raised from the dead one day. Some to everlasting condemnation, and some to everlasting life. Depends what we do with Christ right now. But Paul makes the point, is making a point, that the message of the resurrection, he's going to impact this, is that the world matters. It's a logical deduction. That if we deny the resurrection of the body then we're, in a real sense, denying the gospel because that rests upon the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our destiny is tied to his destiny. There are implications for this. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. That's so important. In 1980, I read a book by Josh McDowell and, a, and another guy, I think his last name was Stuart. It was called The Resurrection Factor. I was in university at the time and I just started walking with the Lord. And I read this book, The Resurrection Factor, and I remember what an impact it had on me. And Josh McDowell was arguing f- from verifiable evidence about the truth of the resurrection of Christ. And though I, I believe that Christ had, ra- had been raised from the dead, that God had raised him from the dead, Reading that book just drove into my heart the reality of that. And it just had such an impact on my life. That's what Paul's concerned about here. Paul is saying that if you don't believe, that, that, that if you don't believe in your own resurrection, you have a hard time believing in Christ's resurrection. But when you believe that God raised him from the dead, it'll make a huge difference in your worldview and how you live. So there's this logical problem that if we deny the resurrection of the Christian, then we are denying the resurrection of Christ. And then in verses 14 and 19, he unpacks that with four consequences. And the first one is this. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Last week I pointed out that Paul used a different word in the earlier part of 1 Corinthians 15, vain. And and the idea that if you believed a message that was without substance, if you believed a so-called gospel message that was without the substance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then your belief is useless. Paul is using a different word here, but it's kind of the same idea that if Jesus Christ has not been raised, if God has not raised, I want to emphasize that, then our preaching, that means the message that we're proclaiming, it is empty and your faith is empty. It's a logical peril here that if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then the message that we as a church hear every week is empty, it's useless, and your professed faith is useless. In fact, our time together is useless. It's empty devoid of truth, and therefore of no person, of no purpose. If Christ did not rise from the dead, and people believe that he did, then they're believing an empty promise. Though they may be starving and thirsting for reconciliation with God, their faith is in vain. They believed a fraud, and therefore, their faith is a fraud. And the world who doesn't believe that Christ rose from the dead would have every right to look at this here on a Sunday morning and say, oh, shame, what fools. 
absolute truth exist. And Paul is arguing from that. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. I'm reading a book right now called The Anxious Generation by a man by the name of Jonathan Hyatt, who's written a lot of great books about sociology. He wrote a great book about, the, about um, helicopter parenting and how we need to stay away from that. In this book, The Anxious Generation, he's really concerned, particularly in American context, of children who are being exposed to smartphones at an early age and how there's been an uptick, a huge uptick, in anxiety and depression amongst children ever since 2010 when the smartphone came out. And in this book, he's arguing for some um, policies that the government and school should have and, and practices that parents should have to protect their ch children from the abuse of the smartphone. Now, Jonathan Hyatt is an atheist. And in one of his chapters, he talks about some spiritual benefits and spiritual practices that we should all engage in to help ourselves to not be addicted to smartphones. He talks about the importance of prayer. He talks about the importance of Sabbath. He talks about the importance of communities of faith. And then he very honestly says that he doesn't believe in these things, but he finds value in them. And as I read that, I thought, this is so classic. Because the world we live in today says, I have my truth, you have your truth. There is no absolute truth. And so there's no absolute truth. Whatever, whatever works for you, go for it. And I thought to myself, Jonathan Hyatt, who's a brilliant man, I thought, why would you practice something that you thought was a lie? In many ways, the solution he's offering is worse than the, the disease. Because you don't want to build your life on a lie. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul has just said in the first 11 verses that this, the, the, the truth of the resurrection is biblically grounded. It is historically verifiable. And therefore, he's arguing it's fact, it's truthful. And if it wasn't, we'd be fools to carry on. Paul says, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we've believed a lie and we're living a lie. Our faith is absolutely empty. I'm reading, I started reading last week because I want to be cultured. I started reading the Lord of the Rings series. So I'm reading The Hobbit. And I'm almost done with it. I mean, it's just a, it's a great book. And I'm reading this Hobbit, and I, I read it at night. I have, a, I have a process of things I read. I don't read heavy theology at night because I won't sleep. But I read The Hobbit because it's, it's fairy tale. It's a nice story, and I can sleep well. Except for that guy who says, my precious. <laughs> That's kind of freaky. Or Smog the dragon. But reading that, I know it's a fairy tale, and I can get some enjoyment out of that, but it's not something I'm going to build my life upon. But if the resurrection of Christ is merely a hobbit, if it's merely a fairy tale, then we're foolish. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain, our message is empty, it's purposeless, and your faith is useless. He goes on secondly and says, here's a second logical consequence. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ from, raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. And don't miss that. He says, we're saying, and this is really important, that God raised Jesus from the dead. There's a theological point there that we need to really grab a hold of. All through the book of Acts, whenever the apostles proclaimed the gospel and they spoke about the resurrection, or the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, they would point fingers and say, you crucified him. But when it came to the resurrection, they, they, they were very careful to say, 
God raised him from the dead. In other words, Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. God the Father raised him from the dead. And so the gospel is putting that to the test in a sense. The gospel is is claiming that God is the one who raised Christ from the dead. Paul says, if God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, then I am misrepresenting God. Because I'm telling you, and the other apostles are telling you, that God raised him from the dead. But his argument is this. If there's no resurrection of believers then that means that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead by God, and we are completely misrepresenting him. You can imagine Paul, who's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who studied at the feet of Gamaliel, this man who had a a strong orthodoxy. The idea of misrepresenting God was terrifying for him. Paul says, we're saying that God did this, and if God didn't do this, then we're guilty of misrepresenting God. We are guilty of lying about God. We are guilty, put it this way, of bearing false witness against him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a truth that is grounded in the character of God because he made promises he would raise his son from the dead. We know that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and as I mentioned last week, the perfect tense is used here, that he raised Christ from the dead to die, to never die again. And it's very, very serious to claim that God did something that he didn't do. But can I apply that in a bit of a different way? It's also misrepresenting God when we say that God didn't do what he said he did. I remember maybe 1991. You know, they say the older you get, your long-term memory is good. I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can remember 1991. In 1991, watching SABC News, and the presenter, I think his name was John Bishop. Remember anybody old, that, old enough? He was interviewing Desmond Tutu around Easter weekend. It was Easter weekend. And he asked Desmond Tutu, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And from the answer that Tutu gave, he was kind of dancing around the question. And John Bishop just kept pushing and pushing. And he said to him, I want to know, do you believe that Jesus Christ bodily, physically, rose from the dead, to which Desmond Tutu said, I believe that the Spirit of Jesus lives. That is not what John Bishop asked him. And there's lots of people today with the title reverend, and lots of churches today that would have a cross in them that actually deny what God claims he did. Jesus Christ, it wasn't just the spirit who rose, he rose bodily. And that matters. Because he was put to death in the flesh for our sins. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ in his flesh was God's ultimate vindication that when Jesus said those words on the cross, it is finished, it was finished. We dare not misrepresent God. We dare not say about the resurrection less than the Bible teaches. We also dare not say more than it teaches. I forget the name of the book. I was trying to remember it this week that I read years ago about a a couple whose um, young child, young, young son died. And they were persuaded from people in their church that God would bring them back from the dead now. And they, and, and, and they guarded his, his corpse for days, praying, expecting God to bring him back from the dead. And they took scriptures and they twisted those scriptures and said, because there's a resurrection in Christ, because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he will live. They misrepresented God. The bodily resurrection is a promise. But first of all, we have to experience 
death. My wife said to me yesterday, she said, you know, there still is a little bit of a sting to death for the Christian. She said, but whereas it used to be the sting of a scorpion, now it's simply the sting of a little bee. And I thought that's helpful. Believers, we experience death. And that can be painful. But we have the hope of a bodily, physical resurrection. Thirdly, in verses 17 and 18, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's a different word. It has the idea of complete meaninglessness. And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Why? Because they'd still be in their sins. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then we have no gospel. I can't emphasize this enough. Because I run into this all the time. And I have to guard myself with this. When we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, so often we, we, we speak about the cross, which is obviously vital. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, when I came amongst you, I came to, to, let, to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. But that's shorthand for the whole gospel. Christ dying for us without a resurrection simply makes him a martyr or even a fool. It could make him a liar. It could make him a lunatic if he really believed that he was a savior and he wasn't. But the resurrection proves, vindicates that he is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so by God raising him from the dead, that completes the good news. The gospel is, yes, the good news that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, proves he was dead, but the resurrection proves that his death was sufficient. It was effective and will always be. To believe in a so-called gospel that does not have the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to believe a lie. And it's futile, it is meaningless, and we're still in our sins. What does that mean? That means we're still under God's condemnation. You know, a truth that I've been mulling over for some time now is a simple mathematical um, part of the gospel. That everybody in the world has two options. To either experience one resurrection and two deaths, or to experience one death and two resurrections. The wages of sin is death, right? Christian, we, we had a memorial services for two Christians this week. They're Christians, they believed on Christ, and they died. There's no promise that believers are going to escape death. It's a part of living, because we live in a sin-cursed world, we have sin-cursed bodies. So everybody, including Christians, are going to die. But those who have been born again, they've experienced, first of all, resurrection, resurrection of spiritual life. That's what Jesus meant in John chapter 11. On the resurrection of life, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. What he's saying is this, even though you're going to die physically, you, spiritually you live, you've had a spiritual resurrection. And because of that, when Christ returns, we will have a bodily resurrection. Two resurrections, one death. You with me? The other option is, you're born in this world, the wages of sin is death, and you die physically, but then you experience what Revelation 21.8 describes as the second death. And the second death is an eternal separation under the wrath of God. So everybody here this morning, you're in one of those two groups. And by hearing the gospel, you're given an opportunity to say, God, I want two resurrections. Believe on Christ, and that will be true. True. 
Paul says that if the resurrection of Christ didn't happen, then you're still in your sins. And then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they perish because they're still in their sins. It's been a heavy week for the church, every two weeks. But aren't you glad for the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Aren't you glad that those that we celebrate their life this week and the mother that Alan will celebrate this week because they believed on Christ, we know that they died not in their sins. And therefore they will not spend eternity in their sins. They died in Christ. And their destiny was tied to his destiny. And because he rose from the dead, they will rise from the dead. And for that reason, Paul argues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there is hope. We grieve, but not as those without hope. And fourth and finally, if we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And can I just say this? That verse gives the lie to Pascal's wager. Because if you believe that Christ rose and he didn't, then we, according to Paul, are the most miserable people around. We're to be pitied. Look at those fools. They're being persecuted for a lie. Look at those fools. They're investing in a kingdom that doesn't exist. Why don't they just join us and eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die? If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, if his body corrupted like ours and turned to mere dust, then we Christians have been deluded and non-Christians have every right again to say, oh, shame, what fools. To face, to follow Jesus Christ, as Paul's going to unpack in the next section, is to experience hardship. It's to experience persecution. And Paul says, if the only hope that we have is a false hope, and it's in this life, then we're to be most pitied. Now think about this. Sadly, Sadly, many professing Christians do live that way. They live as though there will be no resurrection into a new creation. Therefore, in a real sense, they live as though Christ did not rise from the dead. And the proof of that is they live, like Paul said later in this chapter, Basically, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. So all their investments are in this life. The biggest pursuit is career. Young people, your biggest pursuit is the best marks. Your biggest pursuit is to be number one in your class. We pursue to, to, to have great health because we want to extend our life, and that's our main concern. We're always checking our VO2 max. We live for things. We're stingy investing in the kingdom because we don't really believe that what we do now matters. Paul's whole argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is that the resurrection tells us that it matters. And that it matters in every realm of our life. That if we believe that Jesus Christ is risen and on the right hand of the Father, and by the way, if you, want to, if you don't believe that, read Acts chapter 7 again. Stephen looks up and sees Jesus right there. If we believe that he's risen, if we believe that we're going to rise from the dead, then we're not, we're not obsessed with this life. While at the same time, we're saying what we do in this life matters for the next life. This is why Jesus said, 
Don't be foolish and lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupts, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts. We invest our time, we invest our treasures, we invest our children in that which will last. There are logical applications to the logic of the resurrection. It really affects how we handle our disappointments. You know, I read yesterday in uh, USA Today, you know, I don't know if you've heard, have you heard the name Donald Trump? <laughs> He's in the news lately. And I read this article last night before I read The Hobbit. And it said something like this, presidential elections can create anxiety. And then it went on to say that the increase in heart attacks can occur because of presidential elections and the anxiety. And I thought to myself, really? Well, yeah. If all your concern is about this world, then you better be anxious. Think about our own elections this week. I mean, wow, what a result. Now you got all this vying for coalitions. And uh, the Daily Maverick is just filled with pessimism. But I'm thinking, yeah, we live in this world and there might be troubles, but thank God Jesus Christ has risen. And I don't know what he's going to do in our land. I'm praying for some great things. But if we believe that Christ rose, we believe that we're going to rise again one day, what's a small little segment of history? Look to Christ. If we believe that Jesus Christ rose and one day we're going to rise with glorified bodies into a glorified universe, then we can deal with the disappointments of, of poverty. We can deal with the disappointments of singleness. We can deal with tears, but deal hopefully even with an empty womb, with heartaches, with difficult spouses, with broken relationships, with enemies, and with the death of loved ones. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I point again to the events of this past week. Lots of sorrow. I, 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 have, I have woken up. Uh, many nights this week, in the middle of the night, just praying for families in this church who are grieving. And I still am going to be praying. The grief is real. But because of the truth of 1 Corinthians 15, there is hope. Remember, Christ rose from the dead. Remember, Christian, that one day you will rise from the dead. And it matters. But if you're outside of Christ, you too will rise from the dead. But instead of hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant, you're going to hear, depart from me. It doesn't have to be that way. As Tommy said earlier, today is the day to confess you're a rebel against a holy God. But he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save rebels, to transform them, to make them new again, to make them into a new creature in himself. Repent and believe on Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again for our justification. Let's pray. But in fact, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. We thank that because he rose, we who are his people will rise as well. We do pray today, Father, through the ministry of your spirit, drive this resurrection factor into our hearts. And may we respond accordingly. For your honor and glory we pray.
Amen.